Hi there, Simon from SimonWoods.com. I have six wines in front of me and, uh, well, they're all from Portugal. Uh, that's uh, all I can say about them. They're, they're, we go from white to red, we go from dry to fortified, and, uh, well, let's just dig in and see where we get to. Uh, first one is a Vigna Verde, um, and uh, it's from a co-op, the uh, Adega de Moncal, and uh, 2000, and uh, have we got a vintage on here? Um, phew, golly, I can't see one, but uh, I imagine it's uh, it's probably 2012, but it may be 2011. I just I really can't see from here. Anyway, let's dig in and see where we get to. Classic spritz of uh, young Vigna Verde, and uh, stick my nose in, and there's this juicy pear, uh, ripe red apple, and... Uh, it's, uh, sometimes Vigna Verde has got this uh, slight salty tang, and uh, to be honest, I don't get much of that here. Uh, it smells like it's, it's quite a bit richer than I, mean, so I, I was expecting in, in terms of uh, its fruit concentration, but 11.5%, it's um, on that lower alcohol side, as uh, a lot of Vigna Verde is, although some of them can get quite high if they're all al made from Alvarino. Anyway, I'll shut up and I will uh, taste it. And there is a little bit of salty tang when you come to taste it, uh, but there's also, well, I mean, if you know, if you know Alka-Seltzer, you get that slight mixture of the sherbet and uh, the saltiness. Uh, you get a little bit of that, and then the fruit flavours come through. doesn't feel like it's amazingly crisp, uh, and uh, the bubbles certainly help make it that, that little bit fresher, uh, but one of those classic chill it down, bring down your grilled sardines, and guzzle it. Uh, and I think I would probably do that um, with gusto. Wine number two, uh, slightly um, inland from uh, from the Vigna Verde. Uh, whoops, do you see that pop out then? <laughs> um, so this is Quinta de Romanera, uh, and we're in the Douro. This is their 2011 Branco. Give it a whirl. Well, this is another one that's not hugely uh, huge in alcohol, 12.5%. Uh, but I stick my nose in there, and it feels like, yeah, you're going to get a richer, rounder, uh, fleshier wine. Um, it's got some of the pear I was getting in the first one, but... Um, it's these ripe lemons and herbs, um, yeah, things like fennel and uh, a, li a little bit of lemongrass coming through. It smells good. And it is good too. Um, it's strange, I, I get this with quite a lot of the Douro whites. Um, you think you're going to get something crisp and almost Sauvignon-esque. And you do get some of those same uh, uh, similar aromas, those grassy citrus. Uh, but then you get this extra, it feels like it's got a little bit of extra oomph. Um, and the herbiness comes through. Uh, I'd have put that at slightly higher alcohol than 12.5%, than but uh, I do like it. Um, what's, what's strange is the more it hangs around in your mouth, the more the fruit, uh, no, it doesn't disappear, but the more that herbiness comes through. And, uh, yeah, you're getting life beyond fruit, which is what I want. Let's see whether I get life beyond fruit in number three, which is um, uh, Tagus Creek, Chardonnay of Fernal Pires. The idea of the... Um, um, Tegas Creek ranges uh, a familiar grape, Chardonnay, with a local grape, Fernal Pires. Uh, Fernal Pires is one of those grapes that uh, changes sex as it goes through uh, Portugal. Uh, in, in some parts it's known as Maria Gomez, and then you head further south and it becomes uh, Fernal Pires. So this is from the Tejo region. Uh, give it a whirl. It's got some of that almost um, Alka-Seltzer-like uh, character I was getting in, in, in the first one. Um, it feels beyond that uh, slightly simple uh, but pithy lemon uh, type of scent coming through. And it's okay, there's this um, peachiness about it. Um, it's juicy, there's a bit of... Uh, um, uh, toffee. I don't, I don't know whether they've, um, they, they've used some uh, oak of some form to give it a little bit more richness. It's okay. Um, I'm not jumping it but down. I'd, I'd have almost preferred uh, more of the Fernal Pires uh, to, to come through and uh, exert its steely backbone. Uh, at the moment it's a bit too much uh, plump peachy Chardonnay. Not that it is a big plump peachy Chardonnay, but I'd have preferred a little bit more of the sleeker Fernal Pires. I'll shut up. No, I won't, because I've got to introduce wine number four. So that was the Tegas Creek White. This is their Rosé, uh, and again, the same idea, local and uh, foreign. So Shiraz Turiga Nacional Rosé, 2011. Again, Tegas, give it a whirl. A bit boiled sweet. Um, sweet rosehip syrup. Um, doesn't smell... Um, it smells like it's going to be on that, that slightly heavier side of rosé. Maybe I should be hanging out for a 2012 vintage of, of, of this, but um, yeah, it feels a little bit um, thoddy. Ripe, clean, berries, this rosehip character. Uh, but um, it's got that touch of sweetness on the, 
on the finish and I don't think it needs that. It, it, it gives a little uh, tinned fruit syrup character which uh, I'm not, I, I want a little bit more fresh, freshness and liveliness in my rosé. Hey. Let's see whether I get freshness and liveliness in rosé port. Uh, there aren't all those many rosé ports around, um, uh, and I've not seen one from these guys before. Quinta de Tedo, rosé port, and um, well, let's just dive in. Now, I'm not quite sure how they've made this. Um, some You can make rosé wine from blending white uh, with a little dollop of red, or you can make it, you can start off making a regular red wine and then take the, the grape skins off when just a little bit of colour has, has, has gone from them. I've got a suspicion that that's how they've done here, that, that what they've done here, because it, it feels like it's got more of those uh, red fruit flavours that I associate with uh, a wine which started off white with a dollop of something else in there. So I'm getting a little bit of strawberry, letting it, getting a little bit of plum, um, and um, there's some of the spice and the, a little bit of the violet that you, that, um, that you get in some uh, red ports, but um, it smells okay. I'm trying to think of other uh, rosé ports I've had. Croft do one, and uh, I think they also did it for... Uh, Marks and Spencer's has a version. Here, it feels like there's a little bit more grunt and tannin and uh, grip about the wine. There is some of the, um, it's like vanilla character uh, that I associate with a white port coming through, but there is also this uh, uh, this strawberry character, strawberry and, and vanilla. It makes you think of uh, strawberry mivy lollies, and there is a little bit of that character, but it's not too sweet. Um, it's a uh, I'd certainly serve it slightly chilled, but I wouldn't over chill it in the way that, uh, that some people do with their rosé wines and do with a lot of white wines too, but that's another matter for another day. Um, I think this is pretty good actually, um, and um, I, I, I've, my uh, roster of, uh, of rosé ports hasn't been great, but uh, I would say that this was the best I'd tried so far. Nice. Okay, uh, final wine. Uh, we are on Graham's Crusted Port, bottled 2006. So the idea of a crusted port, it's, um, it's basically a, vi um, a vintage port from more than one vintage, if that makes sense. No, the idea of uh, uh, there will be, if it had been bottled in 2006, probably it's a blend of the three previous years, maybe with a little bit, little bit of older wine in there. Uh, you mix them together and bottle it, and then it throws a sediment or a crust in the bottle. So uh, I have decanted this. Uh, I'm going to put this bottle down and reach under the table for something else and pour some of this into it. Shouldn't be doing this, probably. I've got a Graham's, uh, oh dear, I've got a Graham's port that I've decanted into a tailor's half bottle. Don't tell anybody, anyway. And this feels stern and juicy. It's got uh, uh, slightly uh, baked, not too baked, but a uh, warm, uh, fleshy berry plum, a uh, bit of damson, and then it's got that classic violet uh, character of, of, of good port coming through. And uh, there's also, yes, yeah, some of this warm earth character, and um, it feels like it's, it's a substantial wine. Doesn't feel like there's too much here that needs to resolve in terms of thinking, oh, I need to lay it down for a few more years. But at the same time, the fruit's got that bit of freshness about it that makes me think if I did want to lay it down for a bit longer, it would still keep going strong. Anyway, I better taste it. And it is good. It's got a heartiness and a juiciness, uh, lots of flesh. Um, sweetness, Graham's, I think, is, is often thought of as being on the sweeter side of the uh, English ports, but um, uh, the fruit is, um, is vigorous, and uh, yes, it's got this fragrant edge to uh, this bold, ripe berry. It's got the skins, damson skins, blackcurrant skins, um, and this plump plumminess uh, in, in, in the middle. A bit of fragrance, a little bit of those violets uh, flitting in there, and um, tasty wine. And um, I mean, they... I thought Tagus Creeks were okay, but um, the, the other four I thought were really, really good. And uh, I will uh, maybe go away and have a glass of one of them, and I will see you soon.